Hello, this is Bryant Myers, author of PMF, The Fifth Element of Health. In this video, we're going to talk about signal processing, which is the analysis, interpretation, and manipulation of signals. And signals, in a nutshell, transfer information and energy from one point to another. Now, there's many areas of signal processing, from some speech recognition, to cell communications, to radio transmission, to images like your television. But in this video, we're going to really focus on PMF therapy signals. And to really understand what is the best PMF signal, we need to look at seven things. The first is the waveform or the signal shape as seen on an oscilloscope. The second is the frequency spectrum as seen on a spectrum analyzer. The third is the intensity or amplitude of the signal, or even better yet, the magnetic flux. Number four is the applicators and the coils that are used in the PMF system. Number five is the pulse strain complexity. Number six is safety standards. And finally, does it work? So I want to show you this image here, and I tell people you need to look at a signal with two eyes. One is in the time domain, which is the eye of the oscilloscope, and that's going to show you the shape of the signal. The other is the frequency domain, which is the eye of a spectrum analyzer, and that's going to show you the, the spectrum of frequencies that's used. So let's start with an oscilloscope, and I've done a couple of videos already showing you a sawtooth and a square wave on an oscilloscope, and what you saw, if you have seen those videos, is that it shows you very geometrically and graphically what the signal looks like. And here's what we want to look for on an oscilloscope. And I've looked at many PMF devices and many signals. We want to see a well-formed signal, a rapid rise and fall peak like a sawtooth or a square wave found in the IMRS, like the Beamer is good, QRS is good, Metathera is good. And I would say the two most research-proven signals are the sawtooth and the square wave. So the first thing we got to look at is on the oscilloscope, the rapid rise and fall, or the DFDT. This is Faraday's law, which I've talked about in other videos. So just to review Faraday's law, there's basically three components. There's the flux, that is how big the coil is times the intensity, and then there's how quickly does it rise and fall. So we have to put all those together and we get Faraday's law. So the interesting thing is on an oscilloscope is that if you have this rapid rise and fall signal, you're going to get a well-formed signal. I've looked at some sine wave systems, like the Vasenduck sine wave, um, the, the biobalance, and it hardly registers anything on, a, on an oscilloscope. And I first thought I was doing something wrong, but no, it's because it's, it doesn't rapid rise and fall, so it's not inducing currents in the near-field probe. So I want to show you a couple good examples of what I feel are good waveforms, and then I want to show you a couple examples of poor waveforms. So here, let's first look at the IMRS square wave. I'm just going to show you the image. You can see it's a well-defined square wave, it's well-formed, has rapid rise and fall, it's going to create wonderful induction in the tissues, which is going to help to charge up your cells. Another good example is the IMRS 2000 sawtooth. Again, very well-formed, you can see it's got a nice rapid rise and fall, and it's going to deliver a, a wide spectrum of frequencies, as we'll see next. Another good one is the QRS, which is very similar to the IMRS, and then the Metathera, which is kind of similar as well. And the Beamer signal is also very good. Now here's some examples of poor waveforms. Number one, I'm going to show you the Vasinducts. They have a square wave setting, which you can hardly see a little blip here. Then they have their sine wave system, which again, hardly registers. And I did try several frequency settings, and I just couldn't get much on my near field probe, which means it's just not inducing much current. Another poor signal is the OMI, and you can see here kind of this upside down little spike and then a, a spike that goes up. Well, that's just from turning a signal on and off. It's, it's an ill-formed square wave. The really good square wave should show more of a sharp line, and I've seen that on, well, you can see it on the IMRS. The IMRS just does it better than anybody that I've seen. But this OMI signal, you're just not going to get much of a range of frequencies. It doesn't really rise and fall good enough. I mean, it's cheap for a reason. Now, another waveform that I'm not excited about is the biobalance, and it's using modulated sine waves. And I took a, it took me a long time just to get a signal to register, and they're supposedly using 5 Gauss. So what's the problem here? Well, again, it's a sine wave. You're just not going to induce much current in that near-field probe. And that near-field probe is like your tissue. So if you're not inducing much current there, you're not going to induce much current in your body. The good signals that I showed you had a rapid rise and fall signal. They had a nice complex waveform that delivers, as we'll see next, a bundle of frequencies. And again, you could see that they did have a nice voltage inductance because from the top to bottom, that's how much voltage is induced with the signal. And the cheap systems just aren't inducing much. So the other eye that we need to look at, and this comes to the next point out of the seven points we're going to look at, is the frequency domain. And we look at the frequency domain with a spectrum analyzer. A spectrum analyzer is going to show you 
all the frequencies that are in the signal. I don't have a spectrum analyzer yet, but there was an independent study done in Europe that looked at all these different PMF systems, and they found the IMRS and the Beamer, IMRS 2000 and the Beamer, had the best frequency spectrum out of all the ones they looked at. And I know that the Metathera and QRS will also have a good frequency spectrum. Now, looking at the other cheap signals we just looked at, especially the sine wave one, the sine wave, you're just getting one frequency at a time. And even if you're doing frequency sweeps, you're still only getting a limited number of frequencies at once. That is not ideal. You want a broad spectrum of frequencies. Why? Because look at this chart here. You can see all the different tissue and cellular resonances of a human body, but roughly between 0 to 50 hertz, but, but it covers a wide spectrum. So if you want to energize all your tissues and cells, like an energetic multivitamin, you need to deliver a bundle, a wide spectrum of frequencies that's going to resonate with all those different tissues and cells. Again, IMRS, Beamer, QRS, Metathera do this very well. The, the other ones I showed you don't. I mean, you're, you're just not getting, it's like taking vitamin B1 and vitamin C, you know, one, one frequency at a time. Take this frequency for this, this frequency for that, where a good signal should give you everything you need all in one, in one session. You don't have to fiddle around with knobs and try to figure out what you need. That's not a good thing. When companies say, oh, you can go from 0 to 10,000 hertz and do any waveform, that's not a good thing. They're basically telling you, you do the research, you figure out what to do. The companies that have done the research and development have spent a lot of their money and research on developing the best possible signal. And that's where the 20 plus years of development comes from, is finding that those signals that create maximum biological effects. So on a spectrum analyzer, we want to see a broad spectrum of frequencies. And one thing that the QRS and the IMRS and Beamer, they do is they, like a graphic equalizer, you know, a graphic equalizer on your stereo is like a spectrum analyzer, just kind of a crude one. And you can boost lower or higher frequencies, bass or treble. So like on the IMRS, we can boost like lower frequencies at nighttime to help you sleep and higher frequencies in the morning to be awake. But you're still getting the full bundle of frequencies on every session. So sometimes people are confused with the way the frequencies are listed, say, by the Beam or the IMRS QRS. Those are just frequency bands that are boosted. Every setting gives you a broad spectrum of frequencies. It's the cheaper ones that you're just getting like one frequency at a time. And I'm going to show you an image here. You can see this image of a, a spectrum of frequencies on the QRS. And then you can see on, on one image, you can see the lower frequencies boosted. And on another image, a higher frequency boosted. And the IMRS is exactly the same, the way that they boost frequencies. And this is important because you want the right frequency for the time of day. The next thing we need to look at is intensity, or better yet, magnetic flux. So people talk too much about intensity. Intensity is not the key. The key is magnetic flux and how rapid the signal rises and falls. So a larger coil for a given intensity is going to have more flux than a smaller coil, based on pi r squared. So if we had a 100 microtesla signal, and then we had one coil that was 1 centimeter squared, and another coil that was 10 centimeters squared. How, just a little pop quiz, how much more flux is in one versus the other? Well, 10 squared, pi r squared, is 100 versus just pi squared, because 1 squared is 1. You're getting 100 times more flux in a 10 centimeter radius coil than you are in a 1 centimeter radius coil, even though they have the same intensity. So you see how you can be misled by intensity? But it's more than that. It's also how rapidly does it rise and fall. So here, again, we could have two coils that are both 10 centimeters, both 100 microtesla, but in one coil we got a rapid rise and fall square wave. The other coil we have a sine wave. Well, even though it's the same intensity, same flux, because the flux changes faster in one than the other, on the oscilloscope we see a greater voltage induction on the rapid rise and fall. So you see that nobody's talking about this except one other scientist. And this is the most important thing. It's all about resonance and induction, not frequency and intensity. When I say resonance, I mean you need a broad spectrum of frequencies to create maximum biological resonances in all your tissues, and you need a rapid rise and fall signal to induce those healing currents. Because slow rise and fall signals, like a, it's sort of like swiping your credit card slow. You're not going to get, the credit card reader might not pick it up because you're going too slow. If you swipe it fast, you get a, a greater signal. Same thing with striking a match, and you want to strike it fast. So intensity is part of it, and the area of the coil is part of it, and the way that it rises and falls is part of it, but you have to put it all together to look at intensity properly. So the coils and the applicators, now this is important. This is where QRS and Metathera drop the ball. 
you want tightly wound, perfectly circular loops because it's only in current, circular current loops that you get a pure magnetic field. So without the circular current loops, like in the QRS, these big oval racetracks, you're getting just a quasi-magnetic field. The field lines kind of bleed out on the sides because there's spacing in between the loops. This is not ideal. The only way you can actually duplicate a magnetic field, like with a solenoid, is with perfectly circular windings, or a flat solenoid like in the IMRS and Beamer. And then there's a lot of companies like the Biobalance and some of the others that, that do have the nice circular coils, but then they're using a slow rise and fall sine wave. So it's like, I just haven't found many companies that do it all right, except for the IMRS 2000 and the Beamer. So I tell people the coils are the antennas or the speakers of your PMF system. Would you buy cheap speakers with a really nice stereo? Of course not. So again, you really want to make sure that your PMF system has a full body mat to cover the whole body with tightly wound, perfectly circular current loops. And you want those to be bigger current loops as well to give you more flux. And of course, like I said, the signal needs to rise and fall very rapidly. Okay, now the next thing is a little more complicated. It's the pulse strain complexity. So this is something that I don't see with many PMF devices. So let me just give you some words that, to ponder. So pulse pause modulation, polarity reversal. On the IMRS and QRS, you have not only a pulse pause modulation, but then you have bundles of pulses within greater bundles, within greater bundles, within greater bundles. Pulse pause modulation just means you've got like say one, two, three pulses, pause. One, two, three pulses, pause. Okay, that's called pulse pause modulation. And it's really like working out with weights or going to the gym. You don't want to just go to the gym and do a thousand curls and leave. I mean, you want to rest in between sets. And because PMF therapy literally is cellular exercise, you need to let your cells rest in between bundles of pulses. And actually, Andrew Bassett, that developed the first PMF device for bone growth, looked at all kinds of variations. And he found that a sawtooth with like, I think his, his signal, which is still used in the orthofix, uses like four bundles with pauses and very similar to QRS and, and the IMRS. So he found that this complexity just created greater bone growth. So it's been proven in research that that's what you need. That's what your body wants. Yet hardly any PMF companies are doing this. They just do repeating waves like the OMI, Vasindux, Biobalance, just, just on and on and on. That is not ideal at all. And you also want the polarity to reverse every couple minutes or so. And IMRS, Beamer, QRS, they all do this. Metathera does too. And why this is important, and some people say, oh, you don't need polarity reversal. Yes, you do. Why do you think pacemakers and other electronic implants do polarity reversal? Well, number one, it, it extends the lifespan of the device. And number two, if you just keep going in the same direction over and over and over again, you can cause burns or tissue damage. When you reverse polarity, it's kind of like just working out with one arm and then working out with the other. I mean, so it kind of just gives a little bit of a variation or rest. Again, this is essential, and it helps further prevent habituation and acclimation. And you're essentially just turning the signal upside down on an oscilloscope. You just see the whole signal just flip upside down. And it's not the same signal. It's a mirror image, so don't think it's the same. It's, it's going clockwise and then counterclockwise. That is different. Number six is that we need to make sure our PMF device is safe. So the ICNIRP, which is the International Commission of Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, they are the world gold standard for setting safety for electric fields, magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields, time-varying electric fields, and time-varying magnetic fields. So what we want to look at is time-varying magnetic fields. And I have really spent some time looking at these charts. And I'm going to put a link below so you can see this for yourself. But essentially, when you're using lower frequencies, your body can handle upwards to, say, 50 Gauss or so. As soon as you go above 25 Hertz, according to some of these charts, the tolerance for intensity drops drops way down to, like, I think, 0.5 Gauss or something like that. I mean, just very, very low. The key here is that the really good low-frequency, low-intensity systems are all safe within these, this international safety standard. The, high, the middle range and higher intensity units are unsafe. And this is not my opinion. I get a lot of flack from high intensity companies that say, why are you saying, you know, that high intensity is bad? It's like, it's not my opinion. This is something that you can see for yourself by international standards. It's unsafe. Now, do high intensity devices have a place? Perhaps. Perhaps with getting professional athletes back out in the field and perhaps with Kentucky Derby horses, etc. But you've got to think of those high intensity devices like an energetic cortisone shot. And like cortisone shots, they have side effects. They can cause damage. You absolutely do not want to use a high-intensity machine every day. Any machine that's making your muscles twitch is, is dangerous to use daily. Finally, does it work? 
So now this is, because there's a lot of variables in PEMF therapy with the signal, the intensity, the flux, the coils, much more so than lasers and other forms of energy medicine. At the end of the day, we can use physics, we can use research, but we also have to see, is it working? And I have looked at the whole community of testimonials in the PMF niche, and the most powerful testimonials I've seen are from the low-frequency, low-intensity devices like the IMRS 2000, Beamer, and QRS. And when I say life-changing, I mean life-changing. I'm talking about things that are with serious issues like cancer, MS, Parkinson's, heart disease, kidney failure. I mean, I have seen like the whole gamut of A to Z helped with these low frequency, low intensity systems. And they're safe to use every day. You can recharge your cellular voltage on a daily basis. So I hope you enjoyed this video. This does conclude my Physics of PMF series. And I'm going to do next a buyer's guide. So I'm going to take together all this physics information we've looked at and we're going to put it into a buyer's guide so that you can have a scientific buyer's guide to look at all the different PMF devices out there 